the only, only podcast, podcast where hindsight is always 2020. And we explore the great books, works, and ideas of the century. Now, here's your host, teacher, and author, Matthew Hines. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Books in Hindsight. I'm your host, author Matthew Hines. Today we have a great show, and it's going to be a historic and a momentous show as well. And I'm going to tell you all about that in a few minutes. But right now, I just want to tell you that tonight's show is going to feature author John Kuykendall, and he is the author of Squatch Files, the evidence and true stories behind the legend. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, podcast, and it's also going to kind of be a, I don't know what they call it, I guess they call it a segue into a whole new exciting uh, avenue that uh, Books in Hindsight is going to take. But before we get into all of that, I just want to make it official to everybody that Books in Hindsight, as it exists, as it has existed since November of last year, is going to be changing its format. So what does that mean? That means that uh, I'll still keep the website up and all of the podcasts that our uh, authors have, have done, those will still be available in the archives uh, on Libsyn and wherever they are. Uh, But I'm going to take this show and take it into a new direction, a new, more exciting direction. And I'd like to take just a couple of minutes before we get into Squatch Files. And I want to explain to you why uh, this. I felt that this was uh, necessary. Now, the first thing I want to say is I want to say thank you to all of the authors that have been on this podcast. They have given me their time. I mean, it's not easy to say, yes, I'll go on some complete stranger's podcast and put my book and my my works on the line when, you know, I, I don't really even know what I'm doing. And, and there is, uh, of course, some kind of fear and trepidation uh, for anybody who does that because, you know, it's public speaking. So for all the authors that have appeared on my podcast on Books in Hindsight, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I thank you for taking a chance on this you know, relatively unknown uh, podcaster. And, you know, they basically using their credibility and their good names have created a nice little uh, niche for myself as now people have come to know me as a fairly adequate podcaster. And that is evidenced by the number of uh, subscribers that I've already got. Now, along those lines, I want to just point out something that I I noticed while I was doing the podcast. Now, when I started the podcast, the idea was <clears throat> that I would take authors and I would let them come on my podcast and talk about their books and promote their books in as, as, as any way that they could. And I was going to promote their books as well because I wanted to feature affiliate links where they could go down and, and buy, um, buy the books. Now, the only way that that's going to work, I mean, financially, uh, and let me remind you, I didn't monetize this channel on YouTube. I didn't I don't advertise. Uh, I don't do anything except for ask for Patreon, you know, subscriptions. And um, I ask you to check out my books at hindsight.com. But beyond that, um, there's no commercialization of this podcast or, or any of that stuff. So uh, what that means is that um, I 
didn't make like, I, I mean, uh, uh, my authors were great and I had some authors that were just gangbusters. They had so many uh, viewers and so many people interested in their books that I made money from their books on the affiliate links. And I'll give you one great example. And one, this is really what opened my eyes up to this was I had James Gilliland from the East Eddie Ranch on and he um, had like, I thought, well, he posted my video. He posted the link to my video on his website or on his newsletter, but I had thousands. I mean, still have thousands of views. Uh, James is a rock star, uh, like nine or 10,000. And then all these people came, Oh, I want to buy his books. And, and they did. So, so that was the idea right there. But the fact of the matter is, uh, most authors, uh, especially the ones that I've had on the show, um, are, you know, like myself, relatively unknown authors, except uh, in their certain niche. So there was the, where James had this interest from all over the internet, all over the world. And I had, had other ones like Irene McCammon. Uh, she was a UFO researcher. I had uh, Major Ed Dames, uh, head of the remote viewing uh, section of the um, Army. <clears throat> All these people brought in a lot of um, of viewers, and a lot of people were interested in buying their books. But the thing that I found out is that the more interested, the more likely that people are going to buy those books, the le- less likely that author is going to be available to do a small podcast like mine. And then in the world today, you really, I mean, I, I, I have all niches. Um, all across the board, I said anybody with any idea, like I have conservatives, I have extreme liberals, I have psychics, I have uh, very religious people, I have, um, you know, mother authors and uh, playwrights and all this spectrum of people. But um, there's no niche. And so I think that uh, that might be a problem. In that it's, you know, you could have politics, books, or whatever, but I I did try to cover the whole niche. But the point of all this is, is that I did find out that in the paranormal UFO, you know, community, there is so much interest across the board, so much interest. Every author that I had on here, from remote viewers to people who have aliens show up at their ranch or everybody in between, they have a very big base. And it's, quite frankly, it's very profitable. And I, you know, am like anybody else, I want to get paid for the time that I spend uh, doing this because it is a lot of hard work. And I would put uh, at least 10 hours into a podcast, and I would be up late, and and it would take so long to upload because I have really slow Comcast Uh, internet, like um, four or five hours at night, you know, I'd have to sit there and watch my computer because my internet is so bad. So um, it was, it's a lot of work and, you know, except for in those cases with the UFO researchers, whatever, or, or people that dealt with stuff that was kind of paranormal-ish, like Carrie Cassidy at Project Camelot, it was very hard to, to, to get that interest. So I just want to say that so that people understand what I, what is coming up next and the direction that I'm taking it, this podcast in. So now, with all of that being said, I am taking this podcast and I'm going to change it to Encounters USA. Now, do you see that? Encounters USA. And what we're doing today with John Kuykendall's book is we are going to be basically establishing the topic and uh, the parameters of at least one avenue of what we're going to be looking at when we get, we're going to change this podcast and it's going to become Encounters USA. Now, John Kuykendall's book is about uh, the Bigfoot, the Sasquatch mystery. And so that is just one branch of what um, I'm going to be talking about. What I'm also interested in, even more than Bigfoot, if that's possible, 
is, uh, yeah, in my book, uh, Mormons, Freemasons, and Extraterrestrials, um, I want to uh, study those um, topics, and, and I'm still going to bring authors on, no problem, but this podcast is going to be, we're going to be collecting evidence. So what does that mean? I'm going to be collecting as many accounts as I can, and I'm working with uh, the Squatch Files. Uh, that's John Kuykendall. Um, they have a, an, an amazing worldwide research organization. So they're going to be feeding me um, information. And I came so close to having John on the podcast, but he promised me that when we get switched over to Encounters USA, uh, he'll come on. He just he is moving or something. So. He, uh, he he wasn't available to do the podcast. So, and even though I tried getting uh, as many people as I could from his organization, there just wasn't anybody available when I wanted to go on air. So, uh, that's no problem because we can talk to those people when we switch over to uh, Encounters USA. But I want you to understand, all you books in hindsight fans, that this is we're going to still be having books, but uh, and authors, and it's going to be a kind of that same format. But more than that, we're going to be having these exciting accounts of people that have seen um, not only Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but also we're going to be talking about alien encounters, alien abductions, and we're going to be talking about something that I really had no knowledge of. And I apologize to people in the South and people from Michigan and Wisconsin, but um, I didn't know anything about this dog man. And so I've been listening to uh, like these uh, podcasts late at night about this dog man. And that stuff is really creepy. So I have got my own ideas about this. And I've talked to like John Kuykendall and people with working with his organization. And we're starting to come up with a theory uh, based on people that are have disappeared, based on uh, individual sightings, about what these people are. And I'll just give you a hint that my Encounters USA site deals with Bigfoot, UFOs, and the Dogman. So we're going to be getting accounts of those things, of, of interactions, of encounters, even abductions um, of those things. And we're going to, and I just want to make sure you understand, these are going to be severely vetted and um, they're going to be investigated as much as possible. Now, one thing that I'm also doing on my, uh, on my, not my podcast, but on YouTube is I live in Washington state and there are so many uh, Bigfoot sightings and Sasquatch sightings from history to the present. And I am going around uh, and checking out those sightings and checking out the descriptions, the locations and uh, telling the story, but also seeing if is, is it really plausible for this to have happened here? And, you know, and, and at least you just get a feel for the location where this sighting or encounter actually happened. So that's um, what I'm going to be doing as part of my YouTube channel, as well as covering, you know, the new news with UFOs and dogmen and, and Bigfoot. But um, on the podcast, we are going to be uh, taking these accounts, at least at first, and then we're going to invite people to call in and we're going to record their um, their um, podcast or not call in. We'll just interview them on Zoom like we've always been doing, but we won't show their faces. We'll just do that, use that for the podcast unless they, they don't mind. But um, this is the, uh, where we're going to go. And I am also uh, working on a book. I'm doing uh, some editing and I am have my own idea about what these things are, about who they're associated with. Um, even possibly why they're here. But all of that is going to come out in a book that I'll probably have out within uh, two months, hopefully. And that will explain a lot so that you will be able to, you know, when you hear what I'm talking about, um, I'm not going to sit here and, and say, well, you know, I believe in Bigfoot. Uh, I think I, you know, and I believe in UFOs and 
Well, that, I, I think we've gotten so far past that. What I'm going to start the the argument or the um, discussion with is not as to whether they exist or not, but we're looking at compiling data. Um, we're looking at trying to find um, individuals and uh, corroborate sightings of individuals and possibly even start to establish uh, what they would call in um, detective work uh, like profiles um, of, of individual creatures. Now, we're going to be talking about um, this dog man. And another thing that, that I would like to start to compile is uh, we have a lot of information from David Politis 411 books about missing people from national parks. What we don't have is we don't have stories about people that disappear just from their car. I mean, they find a car on the side of the road. Where did the people go? People just taken from their houses. And when we get into this uh, subject and topic, we're really talking about uh, either dogmen or UFOs. Um, and now I just want to, you know, give everybody this caveat that we are giving an explanation that is not the only explanation, but where all other things fail, it's the only explanation left. I mean, there were, where rationality and um, reason and physics and, and all of that fail, then we have to go to other measures to try to explain these things. And the only way that we can corroborate, co corroborate them like Elmer Fudd corroborate these <clears throat> encounters, disappearances, et cetera, et cetera, is with a lot of data collected from credible witnesses. So that's what we're going to be doing on Encounters USA. We're going to be using a old fashioned map or probably a Google map actually, but we're going to be using a map and we're going to start pinpointing uh, sightings and uh, locations and we're going to start getting descriptions of, of uh, creatures and we're going to start trying to compile as much scientific data as we possibly can. Now, I'm going to just say this one time because people are going to ask me again and again, uh, why are you doing this? And I'm doing this number one because I have no doubt that these things are there. Um, and the thing that I, I really have a problem with is I don't think that we should have all these people out in the woods hunting for them um, and bothering them because at some point in time um, they're, I mean, as, as animals, that's going, to, if they're just a basic animal form, well, that is going to cause stress for them, and they're going to try to get as far away as they can. And they don't survive that. No animals do, especially when we're going around just destroying their habitat, which is the next thing I want to really get on, is we need to leave their habitat alone. And we need to be considerate of the fact that these are animals and possibly higher intelligent animals. And... <coughs> excuse me, we want to basically apply the golden rule. We don't want to treat them how we wouldn't want them to treat us. So I'm not out there for knocking on trees and all that. And I understand people are doing research and whatever, but I think that we know they're there. So why don't we just leave them alone? So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And then also I, based on what I, you know, have deduced from the things that I have heard and, and um, from my exposure to the UFOs and listening to accounts of these dogmen, as well as other, you know, areas like um, the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, other things, occurrences, places that have happened in history. Based on all of that information, I think I have a really good idea of where these things are coming from um, and why they're here and what they're, what they're doing here and why they are so elusive. So I'm going to write my book about that and uh, it'll come out in a few weeks and, and it'll be great. 
So let's go ahead and move into the next part of our show. And that is we're going to talk about John Kuykendall's book. It is Squatch Files, the evidence and true stories behind the legend. All right. Now, as I said, I couldn't get John to do the show, but um, I do have the next best thing. I have his book, or at least I have part of his book. And so I'm just going to spend a little time and I'm going to give you um, a little bit of background on his book. And um, then you will have a little bit of background on what we are going to be doing. Now, um, before we start reading this book, please understand that John Kuykendall and his Squatch um, Files, his research organization, of which I am a part of, uh, I'm actually a Northwest investigator. Uh, these guys are have been doing this for a long, 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 long time. And where I'm telling you what I think, you know, I had a nice little talk with John the other day because uh, we were talking about this book. And basically, he has the same ideas that I have, that he's really looking uh, to collect research. And he's established a community throughout the entire world. I think he's gone all the way to the Soviet Union, or I'm sorry, Russia, and um, Poland, et cetera, et cetera, India. So I think that he's um, really taken this organization and in interest uh, worldwide. And so it's just a, an exciting thing to be a part of, especially when we're making the connections that we're able to make now. And none of this would be possible without the Internet. Now, if you don't mind, I would like to just give you a little taste of John's book. Um, now, the if, if John were here right now, I would have to be asking him these questions. And so um, I'm just going to have to ask him kind of and, and come up with my own answer. And maybe later when we talk to John, we'll be able to get a better answer than this. But the Squatch Files book, uh, the story or the subtitle is The Evidence and True Stories Behind the Legends. All right. So let's just look at that for one second. The Evidence and True Stories Behind the Legends. Well, the first thing that uh, John does make clear is he calls the book Squatch Files, which is, of course, short for Sasquatch. And uh, he points out in his book uh, that the term Sasquatch came from the Salish tribe of live uh, nearby where I live right now. Um, they gave him that term. And they thought of this creature, and, um, and this creature is in the lore, and not only the lore, but just basically your um, guide for the area where you live, all up and down the coast from Oregon and California up to uh, British Columbia. So these um, tribes all have different names for it. Uh, also, I should add that um, the tribes all the way going over to Idaho, et cetera, uh, Montana, they all have um, names for this uh, per, you know, per person, this uh, creature, whatever, um, but they have different attributes for it. Uh, a lot of the tribes say that this thing abducts women and children, and they don't have a very favorable uh, outlook for it, whereas other tribes have a more benign outlook on it, and they say it's like a protector, and it's the watcher of the woods. Some people call it the boss man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So John starts off his book by explaining uh, that. And then, you know, as his book says, uh, he explains the, the facts um, behind the legends, well, there were a couple of incidents that happened that John uh, talks about that happened in the early, like, 1900s. And remember that 
before the like turn of the century, uh, there weren't very many people here except for uh, fur traders and trappers and, of course, lumberjacks. But um, the, the lumber industry had not really taken off the way it would when World War I would break out. So um, we're going to just uh, talk about one um, incident where, and this is kind of goes into what we're going to be looking at when we're looking for um, accounts and people telling us what, um, what happened to them, is what we're looking for is we're looking for a personality. We're looking for habits. We're looking for um, how did it interact uh, did it do something differently than than other uh, creatures have done? Um, like one thing that I, I have noticed in all of these uh, Bigfoot or most of these Bigfoot encounters is that this 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 creature um, it kind of rocks back and forth side to side, um, which they say is a very common primitive or a primate um, attribute. It just rocks there side to side as if it's, I don't know, trying to decide what it's, what it's going to do or maybe as if it's um, trying to make itself look like more uh, people to the, the thing it's going to attack or maybe it's just a nervous habit like a bull would um, kick its, dig up dirt in front of its feet before it charged. So we don't know exactly what, you know, these things are, but by um, looking at their habits, looking at how they interact with other people, we can certainly start to understand uh, things about them. Like, are some creatures different? Uh, do some creatures have different personalities? Are women, uh, what, what are the... Um, what are the attributes of, of the women of their clans and what are the roles of children and like, how are their children educated? All these things that you would talk about when you're studying any society as an anthropologist, well, these are all questions that have to be asked. So this is kind of where we're going with um, Encounters USA. And when you listen on the podcast, you'll be listening to me asking about certain things um, that happened uh, during an encounter. And those are questions are based around looking to establish a profile. So uh, let me just start. Um, let me just give you a little taste of John Kuykendall's book. And I'm going to tell you of an encounter that, well, I'm going to actually read two encounters. Um, the first one is an encounter where there was a basically an abduction um, where this, uh, and we're going to talk about one where, as I said, we're looking for characteristics. So in the one case, um, we have basically a benign clan. And then in the other case, we have where men have actually uh, shot at these uh, creatures and incurred their wrath. So let's go ahead and talk about the first encounter where um, this man was abducted. So here we go. One of the most bizarre Bigfoot encounters in history also occurred in 1924, although it would not be reported until many years later in 1957. It involved a man who claimed to be abducted and held captive by a party of the creatures while on a prospecting trip in British Columbia. Although such tales seem to stretch the limits of believability, those who interviewed the man years later included esteemed investigators John Green and Ivan T. Sanderson did not for a moment doubt his sincerity or his sanity. Primatologist John Napier remarked that the man gave a convincing account which does not ring false in any particular. The same cannot be said for all alleged Bigfoot abductions, though. Okay, so in that abduction, and we just have to skip ahead a little bit. Um, t- 
Manitoba Inlet in British Columbia was a secluded wilderness in 1924 when Albert Osman decided to visit there during a much-needed vacation. The construction worker and lumberjack liked to prospect for gold as a hobby, and in addition to doing some hunting and fishing, he planned to search for a legendary gold, a lost gold mine that was rumored to be in the area. Ostman hired an Indian guide to take him to the head of the inlet, and on the way, the Indian told him about a white man who used to come out of the area guide or out of the area laden with gold. When Ostman asked the guide what happened to the man, the guide replied that he had disappeared and had probably been killed by Sasquatch. Ostman scoffed at the story, not believing a word of this tall tale. When they reached the inlet, the guide helped Osman to set up his base camp, and when then he departed. Osman had paid him to return in three weeks. For t- the first week or so, he hunted and fished a little for food and spent quite a bit of time hiking in the woods and searching for any traces of the lost mine. He was quite casual about the search, though, enjoying the outdoors and the freedom away from his work. Then one day, he returned to camp to find that his gear had been disturbed. Nothing was missing, but it had all been moved around. Osman assumed that a porcupine or some small animal had been looking for food. He tried to stay awake for two nights to try and catch the annoying animal, but each time he fell asleep. On both mornings when he awoke, he discovered that food was missing from his pack. Now irritated and determined to trap the culprit, he loaded his rifle and shoved it down in his sleeping bag with his clothes and some of his personal belongings. He planned to stay awake the entire night and drive off the pesky animal. Despite his intentions, though, Ostman fell asleep. Later on that night, still half asleep, Osman awoke to find that he had been picked up, still inside his sleeping bag, and was being carried through the woods. He first assumed he had been tied and thrown over the back of a horse, but then realized that he was pinned into his sleeping bag by two large arms. Unable to reach his rifle or even his knife, he was trapped in the bedroll. There was no sound but the uttering of breath from the figure who carried him. The sound of powerful feet trudging through the forest and the occasional rattle of a fry pan and canned food in Ostman's pack, which the giant had also picked up from the camp. Ostman traveled for several hours and estimated that he journeyed about 30 miles inland. At the end of this time, he was dumped onto the ground and he slowly crawled out of the bag in the darkness. His whole body ached from the trip, and he, as he was trying to massage some feeling back into his legs, the sun came up and the prospector got his first good look at his abductors. Squatting nearby were four hairy giants, the same type of creatures that had been described by Osman to Osman by the Indian guide. They sat there looking at Osman with curiosity, but did not seem threatening in the least. The two older creatures were male and female, and the two younger ones were also of both sexes. The oldest male stood nearly eight feet tall and weighed an estimated 750 pounds. The oldest female was slightly smaller and had large hanging breasts. The younger creatures were of smaller proportions than what Osman assumed were the parents and the younger female had no breasts. All four of the Bigfoot had coarse, dark hair that covered their bodies. Osman later recounted that the older female seemed to object to his presence during the first day of his captivity. She chattered and grunted at the male, but eventually he seemed to win the day and was allowed to keep Osman around. The two females avoided him as much as possible, spending their time hunting for roots, nuts, and berries. The two male creatures were curious about everything the prospector did and found the contents of Osman's pack and sleeping bag to be quite fascinating. He had with him his food, his rifle, a few pots and pans, and his knife. They often looked at these items but never touched them. 
although the oldest creature was very interested in Osman's snuff box and its contents. This keen interest would eventually prove to be integral in Osman's escape. Two days into his captivity, Osman tried to run away. The Sasquatch lived in a small 10-acre basin that was cut between two cliff walls. A narrow break in the rock provided the only entrance. When Osman tried to slip out of the valley, the oldest male quickly caught him and pulled him back into the basin. He considered using his rifle and trying to shoot his way out, but he knew that if he did not kill the creature with the first couple of shots, the beast would surely tear him apart. After six days, Osman had another idea. He was becoming increasingly nervous of the creatures because he was starting to get the impression that he had been captured in order to provide a mate for the younger female. Not wanting to spend the rest of his life in captivity, he began working on a plan to break free. He knew the elder Bigfoot was very interested in his chewing tobacco. Each day he gave the creature a small amount of it to chew on. He wondered if there might be a way to use the Bigfoot's love of the snuff to his advantage. On the morning of the seventh day, Osman made a fire for the first time since he had arrived. He decided to make some coffee, which interested the two, interested the two male Bigfoot. As he was eating his breakfast and drinking from the tin of coffee, he decided to try out his idea. He reached over and offered the older Bigfoot some of his snuff. He held on tightly to the box so the creature could only take a small amount, which irritated him. He jerked the box from Osman's hand and proceeded to devour the entire contents of it. He liked the taste so much that he literally licked clean the inside of the container. It only took a few moments for the Bigfoot to become violently ill. Retching and coughing, the creature ran towards the stream and collapsed on all fours. At the same time, Osman grabbed his rifle and his pack and began to run. He shot towards the narrow entrance, but his escape attempt was noticed by the older female, who set off after him. He made it to the gap in the rock just seconds before she caught up with him, and turning quickly, he fired a shot over her head. The creature stopped in her tracks and let out a squeal, but she did not pursue him any further. Using his compass, Osman managed to make his way back to civilization. After three days, he met up with a party of lumberjacks and told them that he had gotten lost while prospecting. He was sure that no one would ever believe his account of what really happened, and he remained silent for more than 30 years, only telling his story in 1957. Although Osman has long since passed away, Bigfoot researcher John Green knew him for more than 12 years and questioned him extensively about his captivity. He had no reason to consider him a liar, and neither did the police officers, primate experts, and zoologists who also looked into his account. For this reason, we have only the option to consider his story, no matter how bizarre, to be true. But of course, that remains up to the reader to decide. So that is a nice little excerpt from John Kuykendall's book, Squatch Files, The Evidence and True Stories Behind the Legends. So let me just reiterate what I said before. From this account, we can gather certain details about behavior, about habits, and about roles of different individuals in this little clan. These are all things that are very interesting to know because this is how we know how we can protect them and keep people from interacting with them. Now, we also know that there is an aggressive, aggressive side to these uh, creatures. And I don't like to even use uh, creatures um, because I, I think they're like people. And the, the natives said they were people. They were just a different tribe. So, And I'm going to flash a picture up here somewhere. And this was taken by uh, researcher Todd Standing. Now, isn't that an amazing photo? Doesn't that look like a real person? So 
with the advent of, you know, cameras everywhere, we're getting so much amazing footage. And what Todd Standing has been doing uh, in British Columbia is really, really fascinating. So this is an amazing photo. But let's find out what happens when these encounters go south. And it's, of course, these encounters go south because of the behavior of uh, humans in most cases. Now, this is for the Bigfoot. Now, when we talk about the dogman and aliens, sometimes that's going to be not the case. Here we go. In July 1924, a weird incident involving a group of Bigfoot occurred in the Mount St. Helens region of southwestern Washington. The incident involved a night-long assault by unknown creatures on a cabin where four miners were staying. The men had been prospecting a claim on the Muddy, a branch of the Lewis River, about eight miles from Spirit Lake. While working in the canyon, the men occasionally saw huge footprints but had no idea what to make of them. Then one day, they saw a huge, ape-like creature peering out from behind a tree, and one of the men fired his gun at it. The creature was apparently struck, but it ran off. Fred Beck, one of the miners, met one of the monsters at the canyon rim and shot it in the back three times. The creature... It fell down the cliff and into the canyon, but they never found the body. That night, the apes struck back, starting an assault from between two logs, starting an assault on the cabin where the men were staying by knocking a heavy strip of wood out from between two logs of the cabin. After that, there were repeated poundings on the walls, door, and roof. Luckily, the cabin had been constructed to withstand heavy mountain snows, and the creatures were unable to break in. However, they did begin using rocks to hit the roof from above, and the miners became nervous enough to barricade the doors. As the creatures began thumping around on top of the cabin, as well as battering the walls, the men fired shots through the walls and roof, but to little effect. The noises and attacks continued until nearly dawn, ending after about five hours. Even though the cabin had no windows and the men could not see what was attacking them, Beck later told Bigfoot researcher John Green that he was sure that more than two creatures had been outside. The incident was more than enough to get the men to pack up and abandon their mine the next day. They told their story when they, they returned to Kelso, Washington, and a party of men went back to the cabin. Big footprints were found all around it, but no creatures were discovered. There have been other sightings in the area since, but none with such dramatic results. A first-hand account of the events was later written by Fred Beck called I Fought the Eight Men of Mount St. Helens. The area where the events took place later was dubbed Ape Canyon, and it is still called that today. Wow. Well, since we're talking about establishing patterns of behavior and uh, almost a protocol for interacting with these Bigfoot, I think we can safely say don't shoot them and don't shoot them in the back. Um, these creatures are very big and I have not heard, I've heard a lot of accounts uh, or at least the accounts I've heard of them being shot it has never had very much effect. So um, if you do shoot them and uh, another thing that really kind of I'm alarmed at is a lot of these researchers are going out into the woods uh, armed. And I'm sure that at some point in time, that is also going to lead to some tragedy or other. But um, that is just one thing that I, I think that the um, 
we we can establish from patterns of behavior that those creatures know what guns are. And if you point a gun at them, then that is going to uh, signal that your intent is hostile and they will reply and they will reply in kind. So we have to really get to understand these things. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why. Now, since we're talking about Ape Canyon down by Mount St. Helens, well, let me just tell you that um, this we're coming up on summertime and I will be going down to explore a canyon for a further uh, YouTube video. So you might want to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's the uh, Encounters USA channel um, on YouTube. And uh, of course, you'll want to subscribe to the Encounters USA podcast because I'm also planning on going down and interviewing James Gilliland for the new podcast uh, down at Iseti Ranch. And we'll be checking out some UFOs, hopefully, and who knows, we'll get uh, James' take on the Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, as you might want to call it. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, I really want to recommend John's book. It is available at Amazon.com. It's 1999, and it is just packed, packed with information about historical Bigfoot and about the research that has been uh, going on now. And I just want to throw in one thing that uh, some people might find interesting or, or not. But um, when I was a graduate, undergraduate student at uh, WSU, Washington State University, go Cougars. My neighbor was this guy named Grover Krantz. He was a professor and he researched Bigfoot. And so, you know, that was my neighbor and he researched, researched Bigfoot. And, and yeah, so big deal. It's Washington State University, right? What else is new? But um, actually, he, Grover, or Dr. Krantz, had an assistant and his assistant was a, Dr. Krantz was old then. He was like in his 70s, but he had a younger assistant and he would, um, he was about more closer to our age, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s, but he'd come over and he'd hang out with us sometimes. And um, once I remember, he said, you guys want to come over and check out the Bigfoot stuff. And so we went over and we checked out this old dirty room full of uh, casts and uh, I, I don't know what else was there, pictures and whatever else. It wasn't very well kept, but uh, but that was cool. You know, it was interesting. So, but, you know, back that was back at the time when Bigfoot really didn't exist. And, and even though you're looking at the, you know, cast of these things, oh, well, you know, you were brainwashed not to take it seriously. So even though there is evidence, there's there's no Bigfoot. But that's all, of course, changed now, uh, thanks to the Internet and people's massive distrust of the government. But um, we won't go into that. And um, I just want to uh, encourage you guys to check out John's book. John is also coming out with a Squatch Files 2, and, he's, and it's going to uh, basically incorporate a lot of the new um, evidence, some of the stuff that I've been talking about into his new book. So you might want to, um, to check that out as well. So I want to, um, thank you guys for watching my podcast. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, I know sometimes it probably got dry and, and I'll tell you, you know, when I started this thing out a couple times, I forgot to press the record button and, and it was just a nightmare and so many things I was so afraid would, would not, excuse me, would not work. And um, I really appreciate you guys hanging with me. And I appreciate you subscribing to my channel. And I'm sorry about, I think I have belched into the microphone. I'm not sure if the FCC is going to come after me on that one. But um, I do appreciate you guys, you know, hanging out with me and, and, uh, you know, listen to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the guests. I had a lot of really nice feedback. Um, you know, I, I find this stuff interesting and I, I really like talking to people and I really like talking to authors because I'm an author and it's very difficult to write a book. And 
and you want to to get something out there, you have an idea, and you want to get out to as to as many people as you can. And there is nothing better, no better feeling than somebody say, "Oh, I read your book." So that is, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to miss about doing books in hindsight, but but it's not going to be completely like that because every now and then I will um, have a uh, have an author on here that um, that does, you know, write books or or something, but they're just going to be about Bigfoot. And uh, just on that note, I, I, I think I'm going to close by saying this, that one of the reasons that I decided to change the format of Books in Hindsight was that based upon the success of James Gilliland and based upon the um, success of like Major Ed Dames and Carrie Cassidy has so many views. So is all these paranormal people, they really they really get um, all the views, right? So that was, um, that was the thing. I I wanted to get more of those people, right? But I I, I could get those people, no problem. I wanted to get the Bigfoot people. And I've, I've talked about this on a couple podcasts. The Bigfoot people are like Bigfoot. You cannot track them down. And I, I was just going, I mean, I, 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 at least 10 people, I tried to track down and nobody would agree to do my podcast until John Kuykendall um, said, oh, well, I, maybe maybe in uh, June I can do it. So, so, oh, really, June, okay. So then I just started thinking, well, the reason that they don't want to do it is because it's books in hindsight. It's not something that has to do with the topic of their books. So there's another reason right there. I think that this is going to be much better. And for you, the listeners and on the podcast and you guys watching on YouTube, I think you're going to like this and appreciate this format so much more uh, because we're going to be talking about some very exciting things. We're going to be investigating mysteries and we're going to be compiling data. And what is most important for me is that we're going to be able to just talk to, you know, normal guys out there, normal hunters and farmers and uh, you know, school teachers and policemen and pilots, and we're going to just be able to have them on the podcast, tell their story, ask them a few questions, and then go on to the next next one. And it's going to be really, really fun. And in that time, we're going to be compiling data, and we're going to be putting together maps, and we're going to be putting together profiles, and um, we're going to be establishing just kind of what these what these beings are. So. I, I hope you guys will be as interested in that. And I, I hope you'll jump over to Encounters USA, uh, the podcast, the YouTube channel, uh, or the website. Um, and you'll be able to buy, of course, my books, um, there, hindsight.com. But you'll be able to get um, like books about um, Sasquatch and UFOs uh, that are for sale. I'll just uh, have the best ones on my um, on my sites, just like I did for books in hindsight. So for my authors out there that were gracious enough to come on books in hindsight, your podcast is, is going to stay there. Um, what's going to really happen is that as far as my feed goes for where I upload my podcast, it's just the, the Encounters USA will just basically sit on top. I don't know if that's the best best way to say it, but your videos are going to still be there, um, and um, I'll keep the website going for at least uh, a couple years. So I wish you guys that have did my podcast, I wish you luck. And um, for um, Ed Dames and Nick Begich and um, Irene McCammon and um, and uh, Carrie Cassidy and all my paranormal authors, uh, we need to get you back. And we're going to have some other uh, paranormal authors on here as well. But um, it's going to be fun. And I think that you're going to find this uh, podcast and my YouTube uh, channel is going to be a nice way uh, to spend time with your family and to spend time with your loved ones listening to the mysteries 
of the unknown, and of course, of the encounters in the USA. So, very exciting, huh? Well, I once again have to say I, I, I'm kind of sad in my heart, but I established this podcast with certain things in mind, and sometimes things work, and sometimes they don't work the way that you want them to. And so that was the case with this um, with this podcast. And what I learned is that I should be a little bit more focused on the content. And so we're going to go to the Encounters USA format where, as I said, we're we'll talking about the dogmen, the aliens, and Bigfoot. So that's going to be fun. And we're going to be able to get out in the field. And, well, you know, I live in Washington. I'm an avid camper. I love hiking. I'm out on my uh, little paddle ski all the time with my electric motor buzzing across lakes and rivers and Puget Sound. So, yeah, I'm going to be out there looking for Bigfoot. I'm going to be out checking on uh, sightings of Bigfoot. I'm going to be seeing, is it really... You know, is it really believable or is it something that's just too far out there? So it's going to be fun. And I hope that uh, you guys will subscribe to uh, Encounters USA. And wherever I am, I've got a uh, Facebook page. You can join us on that. And um, check out uh, Squatch Files, uh, John Kuykendall's uh, stuff. And um, go ahead and pick his... uh, his books up on Amazon. I'm going to, of course, post the links to his books on the in the comment section of this podcast when I post it. So, with that, uh, I would just like to, um, you know, send out to John. Uh, you know, we are looking forward to having you on the podcast eventually, and uh, thanks for letting us talk about your books. And if you haven't bought John's book, then you really want to uh, get out and buy it because. He's going to have a second book out uh, fairly soon. So with that, do I really need to say it? I believe this is actually, this is actually, this is the, I did the count. This is the 51st episode. I, I have never, ever counted the right way since I started this. So this is the 51st episode. So 51 episodes of books in hindsight. I don't think that's too bad. For November, I've had, I think I've done a couple of my own uh, books, so probably minus seven. So probably we had about 43, 44 fantastic authors and people who work in the publishing industry. So for everybody out there, uh, thanks for watching Books in Hindsight. Thanks for listening to the podcast. For all the authors that spent time with me, I, I have 43 new friends, and I want to support you in any way that I can going uh, down the road. But to have a podcast that was basically tanking, uh, it's not going to be any support for you. So, excuse me, we will we will see you next time. And next time we'll see you on Encounters USA. But until then, please, everybody, for your own benefit, for the benefit of the world, keep on reading. This has been Books in Hindsight with your host, Matthew Hines. Please join us for our next podcast and look for our archives on iTunes and go to thehindsight.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-S site.com for great books by Matthew Hines and other great authors.